power. We're all interested in power. And oh, power is an interesting thing. Man has used it through all of its history, thousands of years. And kings have used it to destroy other kingdoms, to shatter other palaces and temples, and most importantly, to drag millions of people into slavery. But what if there was another way to use power, another choice? Cyrus the Persian was a real warrior king, and he conquered the ancient empire of Babylon. And there's a legend about the night that the capital city, also called Babylon, fell to Cyrus, and the surprising choice he made when he held all the power. It was night in the mighty city of Babylon, and the slaves were nervous. They whispered to one another at the moment of sunset. Did you feel it? The wind turned around completely backward, and it's still blowing that way. The mighty river Euphrates ran right through the center of the city, and the boatmen who pulled the ferries back and forth swore. They swore that the level of the river was dropping. And if you looked up from that river, high above the city, the very tallest buildings were the temples. And in the temples, in their long shadowed halls, stood the silent statues of the ancient gods of Babylon, made of stone and silver and gold and ivory. They stood freshly washed and perfumed because it was the night of the great royal harvest feast. And in the waning light of the moon, their jeweled eyes gleamed as they looked down on the brightly lit palace below. And from the banquet hall of that beautiful palace rose shouts and cheers. King Belshazzar had 1,000 noble guests and his wife all at the banquet feast lavishly dressed and bejeweled. They sat at long tables facing the king at his high table where he sat at his throne against the wall. And there the king ate and into the night matched his guests toast for toast until at last he pushed himself up from the table and raised a wine goblet high and said, we are Babylon. The gods love us. Look, our harvest was so rich, and all of our enemies we destroy. We shatter their kingdoms and take down their temples, and we take for our own treasure all of their holy goblets and cups and ritual vessels of gold and silver to use for our own. So tonight, slaves, go to the treasure house and bring all of those things, because we will use these to toast our great gods of Babylon. And the slaves were nervous. They rushed back into the banquet hall, holding wide trays of all of the jewels and precious things. And they rattled on the trays. And they whispered to one another, these are our holy relics. And they will use them to toast the gods of Babylon. And when all the cups were filled with wine again, Belshazzar stood and said, my people, stand, and now each of you cry out your favorite prayers and formulas to your favorite Babylonian god. And so they did, each louder than their neighbor, until the night was filled with their cheers and their chants and their roars of pride. And then they could hear it under the noise of all the voices. That strange, wrong way wind was beginning to blow, buffeting the walls of the palace. It grew stronger until it blew open the heavy doors of the banquet hall, and then it swirled in like two long, hot arms and snuffed out all of the lamps in the room, except for one lampstand that stood behind the throne of the king against the plaster wall. Belshazzar saw it first. Hovering in the air, a thin, upright line of light, as bright as lightning, 
And then the light began to widen like a crack between two worlds. And out of that crack flowed an icy mist of vapor that billowed and coalesced into a great cloud, dark and gleaming. And as they watched out of the cloud, there emerged a hand, but just a hand. And the hand lifted a finger, and it lengthened so that it could write on the wall. It was soon done, only a few words. And then the hand and the cloud hardened into a black, lacquer, shiny thing that disappeared as it shattered into a thousand shards. The king clutched the back of his throne, and he said, who can read this message? Great rewards to whoever can tell me what it says. Bring the wise men, those who can dream dreams and see the signs, and let them tell me what it is. Now, the Babylonian wise men were famous throughout the ancient world for being able to read signs in the stars and in people's visions. And they eagerly ran into the banquet hall, trailing vestments and shawls painted with strange symbols and occult signs. But when they saw the handwriting on the wall, their steps slowed. And as they stood before the king, they stammered and stuttered, and not one could read those flaming, glimmering words that still shone behind the king. The queen mother stepped up to the king's ear. My son, there is someone who could help you. Now, he is only a, a captive from the land of Judea, but he has told difficult dreams to kings who have come before you. So I say you call him now. His name is Daniel. Daniel stood in the doorway of the banquet hall, wearing a plain dark robe, and as he stepped through all the litter of the banquet, the slaves were relighting the lamps as he made his way to the king. And he stood quietly, watchfully, until it was time for him to speak. O oh, king, I have no need of great reward. My gift of sight, of dreams and visions, I give freely to those who would hear the truth. And then Daniel's eyes closed, and in a moment, flashed open again. And he pointed to each word. Mene, your days have been counted, and they are at an end. Teko, you have been weighed and found wanting. Ufarsin, your kingdom will be divided and given to others. And as King Belshazzar wondered at those words, north of the city, the armies of Cyrus the Persian were marching, marching towards him. For what the boatman had said was true. The armies had dug out a great marshy lake, channeling away the waters of the great river until the level had dropped to just as high as a man's thigh. And the Persian battalions, one by one, stepped into that riverbed until the flow of water became a flow of men. They reached Babylon that night. Belshazzar was killed, and the might and the pride of Babylon was no more. So Cyrus was the victor, and as so many conquerors before, he could have done anything he wanted to the people. But he did something different. He made another choice. And his decision is written right here on this simple clay cylinder. The words say, the captive peoples who live in my empire are free to go home. They're free to go home and take with them all of their holy instruments 
so that they can rebuild their temples in their homelands. Cyrus the Persian, Cyrus the Great, his words roll down to us through 2,600 years of man's tumultuous history. And what they say to us is that where there is great power, there is also a choice. And that choice can be for tolerance. <laughs>